Good morning, guys. God bless you. I hope you've had a good week, a prosperous week, and you are encouraged. If you're not encouraged, then stay with us this morning, and maybe by the end of this uh, broadcast, you'll be encouraged. Let me remind you of the date, 4th of April. We'll be meeting again at Thamesview School. So we're really looking forward to that. Scripture says, do not forsake the gathering or the meeting of the brethren because it's an opportunity to encourage, build and sharpen and express our love for one another. So we will be meeting again at uh, Thamesview School on Thong Lane. If you go on our website, www.effectivelifechurch.org, you'll be able to get a map and details on how to get there. And also, if you want to give financially, make a gift, then you can do that on the same web address and that's on the front page. So I encourage you to do that. Uh, we are uh, certainly coming to the end of lockdown, I'm sure. And I just want to encourage you that, yes, we, this lockdown may have happened, but uh, it's not like nothing has happened. God has been working in so many people's lives and I've had many conversations online with people as to what God has been doing in their lives during this time. And, and more so, uh, dare I say, a refining and a purifying of believers' lives. So I encourage you. Also, if you're, if you're not a Christian and you'd like to explore faith, you'd like to explore Christianity, then you're more than welcome. No matter your situation or your background, we'd love to meet with you. So we will be reconvening on the 4th of April. Don't forget to share the videos on social media, on Facebook and YouTube, whatever you use, because they are a blessing to other people. And we get uh, emails and contacts sometimes from people all around the world who have just come across it. Uh, last week I had a, uh, an email from a guy in the Philippines saying how much he'd enjoyed the preaches on Abraham and Sarah and this journey. So don't forget that. You can also go on to my website, which is uh, www.effectivelifeministry.com. Now, you can go on there and you can find out more about my itinerant ministry and you can support if you so wish to. So today, we are jumping into part 10. Can you believe it? 10 weeks back to back on the life of Abram. And we haven't, I mean, we just bounced like a stone on the surface. We didn't gone real deep in. Imagine if we did. And uh, this week is Abraham and Deja Vu. Okay, Abraham and Deja Vu. So if you want to turn with me to uh, Genesis chapter 20. <coughs> in your Bibles, for those who know me well in the old days, I often have a cup of tea when I preach. I'm an avid tea drinker. So, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I just pray that you would lead us. Holy Spirit, you would guide us into all truth, Lord. That you would reveal through your word, your nature, your heart, your love, your prophetic desires for us, Lord God. That, Father, we could lean on these wonderful characters and experience and learn from them, Lord. Continue to shape us. May, may we be the best version of us for you, Lord God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, last week uh, we mentioned that Lot had gone through all that he had and he left Sodom and Gomorrah and we saw what happened to him going to the mountains and so on and so forth. Now, what I will say, despite everything that happened to Lot, and despite his own mistakes, which were many, Scripture still declares and maintains that despite everything that happened to Lot, he was still a righteous man. Isn't that interesting? His righteousness didn't come through behaviour, it came through belief. And that's the same as uh, Abraham. His righteousness came through belief. And often we think righteousness comes through what we do, but it's actually through the belief. And Lot, despite everything, was still called a righteous man. Abraham and Sarah, despite all their shenanigans, we saw that they were still, uh, God still didn't remove the promise from them. 
So Genesis chapter 20 and verse 1. Genesis 20 verse 1. Now Abraham moved on from there. Now where is there? Abraham had been looking across to where Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah was and he'd seen all the brimstone come down and the fire and all what took place. So Abraham moved on from there near the trees of Manre into the region of the Negev between Kadesh and Shur. Now, he'd, he'd moved away from where he was, from where he'd been. You know, maybe it was just a grim reminder. Maybe it just brings back bad memories. Maybe it's just painful memories. And sometimes, you know, we've got to use a bit of common sense. We've got to help ourselves. Because sometimes where we can hang on to objects, photos, items of furniture, uh, all sorts of things in our lives because they belong to someone special or we had a connection with somebody or we've inherited them. But in actual fact, having that thing also triggers a lot of emotions and tough stuff. And you know what? I say, if it's going to cause you to stumble, then just remove it. Remove it out of the way. And don't hold on to it just for the sake of it or out of obligation. If it's going to cause bad memories to stir or painful memories to stir, then simply don't, don't look at it. It's a bit like having a, a scab. If you keep picking it, you're going to make it worse. You know, sometimes you've just got to cover that thing over and move on. And so maybe for Abraham and Sarah, you know, it was just a painful memory. So they, <coughs> they moved from there. For a while he stayed in Gara. Abraham said, of his wife Sarah, she is my sister. Then Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent for Sarah and took her. Wow, how amazingly quick we can go from being in the presence of God to being led by our flesh. He had just been in the presence of God. He had just interceded for Lot. He'd been in the presence of God. He'd been able to question God, the cheek of it. He, there was intimacy there. And immediately he leaves that place, he goes somewhere else, and suddenly the experience of what he's just enjoyed and the closeness and the intimacy and everything else is now being replaced again through his, his Achilles heel, that constant thing that tripped Abraham most of his life, which was fear. And fear encroaches again. And amazing how quick we can do it ourselves. We can be in the spirit and fall immediately into the flesh. And how many times have I done it? Have you done it? You know, we're in the spirit, we're in the presence of God, and then someone cuts you up in the car park. Do you know what I mean? Or, or a situation happens, or the children. or so, Do you know? It, it, it's just crazy and we get caught up. Or how many times have we, we've been in a situation, we've done something, and we haven't learned from that situation. So Abraham didn't learn from his experience in Egypt where he did exactly the same thing, deja vu. He went to Egypt and he was fearful in Egypt, so he said to Sarah, say, you are my sister. And what happened? The, the king took Sarah and was going to make her his wife. And we suddenly, all of the sudden, we see the king of Ger send and take Sarah for his own. Now, it's likely that Abraham was fearful because this was a wealthy man, an influential man, uh, but fear is no excuse for him to move unrighteously. Fear is not an excuse. Now, I know it's a tough one because we kind of clam up and we, we don't feel bold enough and we feel like the, uh, the rabbit in the headlights of a car. We're just Because that's what fear does. It freezes, it paralyzes, you know? And sometimes it's very difficult, but again, he, he, he doesn't tell the truth about the relationship. Instead of trusting God's protection, he devises his own plan to protect his life and that of his family. This also demonstrates that it's just easy to slip up into the old. You know, how many... How many times on New Year's Eve we, we make declarations of change? Right, I'm going to do this. This is the year. 
I tell you what, one of the longest running declarations is this one. Okay, I'm going to talk too loud. I don't want her to overhear me. Mara. Since I met Mara in 1991, we bought a car in 1991. You know what's coming. Since 1991, <coughs> every year, guaranteed since then, she has said to me, with absolute belief, she's not lying in her intent, with absolute belief, this is it, I'm going to learn to drive. I'm learning to drive. And do you know what, after about 20 years, when she used to say, I said, love, love, save your breath. No, don't treat me like that. I said, love you, you always say, you never do it. Do you know what, this week, this week, she's done it again. Oh, yes. She said, yet again, oh yeah, I really think I'm going to learn to drive this year. Do you know what? I've put my faith and my life at risk in the car with her. I'm happy. I want to support her in it. Fantastic. Time will tell. Deja vu. Been here before? Genesis 20, verse 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream one night and said to him, You are as good as dead. Because of the woman you have taken is a married woman. Now Abimelech had not gone near her. So he said to the Lord, will you destroy an innocent nation? Did he not say to me, talking of Abraham, did he not say to me, she is my sister? And didn't she also say to me, he is my brother? I have done this with a clear conscience and clean hands. Then the Lord said to him in the dream, Yes, I know you did this with a clear conscience, and so I have kept you from sinning against me. That is why you did not touch her. Return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you will live. But if you do not return her, you may be sure that you and all of yours will die. Do you think, wow, what an amazing situation. When we sin, we sin against God. Okay, so we, we have to remember that often when we sin, we're not sinning against mankind, we're actually sinning against the Lord. Because, yes, it is, it is sin against mankind, but you, at the end of the day, all sin is offensive to God. God did not allow... Abimelech to come near Sarah. He protected Sarah. He had ordained that she should be the mother of the Jewish nation and the wife of Abraham, and she should birth the nation. She may at this time already be pregnant, because we don't know how long exactly it was before Abraham moved down to Gur. We don't know exactly. So and the angels had said to her, it will be a year. This time next year you will be with child. So it's possible she was already pregnant. Or it's possible she was about to conceive. But either way, God protected her and prevented the situation from coming about. Sarah was set apart and holy unto God. Abimelech was in danger of touching something that belonged to the Lord. And if it is God's, it is holy. That that belongs to the Lord is holy by default. Why? Because it belongs to him and is a holy God. So therefore, the minute it is received of the Lord, it becomes holy. First Peter chapter 1 and verse... Uh, verse 15 and 16. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. So what is it to be holy? The word holy comes from a Hebrew word called uh, gadosh. And that means separated, marked out, placed apart, withdrawn from common use. I love that. You're withdrawn from common use. You've got a specific purpose. And sometimes, my friends, we can feel like we've lost our purpose. 
And trust me, I have been in that boat and overwhelmed with a sense of barrenness, loss, loss of direction, all that you thought, all that you'd made, and suddenly that balloon's burst or whatever it is, and it's taken from you or you've lost it, whatever the situation, I've been there. And it is really, really tough. But we have to learn that our identity is not in the roles we play. It's not in the places we live. It's not in the people we meet. But our identity is in Christ Jesus. And that identity does not escalate or devalue. It doesn't go up in value or down in value. You know, when you're in, in the world, if you're, if you're a, a, a doctor, for example, or a banker or a solicitor, you know, you've got a, you've got a element of a, a professionalism with you uh, that a lot of people would look up to. You're a learned person, you know. But if you live off of that identity factor for all your life, for whatever reason, when you're not in that role and people just see you as Jack or John or Frank or Marion, sometimes it can really crush your identity because you've made your identity about what you do instead of who you are, okay? Being a doctor is what you do, it's not who you are. Being a Christian, being placed in Christ Jesus, being renewed, having the identity and the Holy Spirit living within you. You are set apart, you are marked, you belong to his. That's our identity. And even a lot of pastors and apostles and prophets and all these sorts of things, when we get to heaven, they won't be saying, oh, come in, uh, prophetess uh, Sharon. Oh, come in, uh, uh, Pastor uh, Abigail or whatever you know, or Apostle John, we'd just be us. We'd probably have a new name. But to be holy means to be set apart, marked out for the Lord. And Scripture says you have been marked and sealed by the Holy Spirit that you belong to God. Your holiness doesn't stem from what you do. Your holiness stems from who you belong to. And it's because of who you belong to you begin to walk in holiness as a fruit of your life. Amen. Leviticus 22.31 says, Keep my commands and follow them. I am the Lord. Do not profane my holy name. I must be acknowledged as holy by the Israelites. I am the Lord who makes you holy. Hallelujah. It's a work of God to man. I am the Lord who makes you holy. And who brought you out of Egypt to be your God? I am the Lord. Other translations say, I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who sets you apart as holy. Amen. See, sometimes people, we don't understand things and we can strive in, in a religiosity, trying to be holy. Now, yes, we need to live as best we can, free from skin, uh, sin and aiming to do good good works unto the Lord, but our holiness comes from Christ Jesus. Because we can't present ourselves as holy. It's impossible. To God, our greatest works are like filthy rags. You know? So he has done it for us. Wonderful. Absolutely liberating. Thank you, Lord. So God has set us apart from the rest of the people on the earth. He has marked us. He has sanctified you. He has called you to be holy. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 says, My people are destroyed through a lack of knowledge. Abimelech did not know that Sarah was married. She had said that Abraham was her brother. Abraham had said, This is my sister. So as far as he was concerned, he'd done nothing wrong. And God is holy and God is just. Hallelujah. God is just. And uh, Abimelech said it was through his naivety, it was in innocence that it made this mistake. Now even if we do something wrong without knowing it, uh, it's still wrong. And God's holiness is so holy and set apart and is all complete righteousness that even when we don't know, it's still, that sin has still had to be paid for at the cross by Jesus. Whether you are aware of it or not, Jesus has still had to pay the price because sin is sin. And King David was aware that he needed to be given, uh, be forgiven 
for his own unknown sins as well as his known sins. And Psalm 19, 12 says, Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins that they may not rule over me. So David deals with both situations. He's saying, look, forgive me for my hidden faults. He's saying, look, I've got faults that I'm unaware of, Lord, and I recognise that. And each one of us, Scripture says, he who claims to be without sin is a liar, and the truth is not in him, before we got all, all get self-righteous. You know? And then he says, uh, and keep your servant also from willful sin. That was a sin that he was conscious of, wanted to do it, was tempted to do it, and sometimes did it. And he says, keep me from these as well. Let it not rule over me. And we can thank God because of the blood of Jesus. David was asking for forgiveness for both. Now, in dealing with sin, repentance is the key. Repentance is the key. God is a God of grace. And when we repent, we're forgiven. We're forgiven, praise God. And we need to repent. And repentance is, is acknowledging, you know what? I shouldn't have done that. It wasn't the right thing to do. And I'm going to stop. That's the fruit. That's the action of repentance. And saying sorry to God is apologising. And we need to do both. Amen? Hyper-grace is not an excuse. Grace is hyper in the Lord. It is. How big is his grace for each one of us? It's amazing. But with that grace comes repentance. And because of that grace, it's not a license to carry on sinning. That is a wrong doctrine. It's false. It's of the enemy. Have nothing to do with it. If you've mucked up, mop up through with the blood of Jesus. Put right, repent, put right, and move on. Because the greatest thing the enemy will want is for you to stay where you are and not move forward and to be trapped in guilt, fear, all sorts of things that go with that. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and will cleanse us from all wickedness. God is still faithful to Abraham and calls him a prophet in spite of Abraham's weaknesses and shortcomings. Enoch was the first prophet in the Bible, but Abraham was the first person called a prophet in the Bible. So God calls Abraham a prophet still. So in a lot of the time, when people muck up, they're stripped of everything and so on and so forth, and they're no longer recognised for what God has called them to be or what, what you are in life. But God does not punish people by removing the calling from people. And Abraham's mucked up yet again, but in spite of the muck up, it doesn't change what God had called him to, and it didn't change the promises to him. Amen? Because otherwise we're just punishing. And that there might need to be some discipleship, there might need to be some discipline. That's different. That's teaching people. That's not rejecting them and sending them out to Coventry, as it's called, or whatever it is, but it is, uh, rejection and sending people away and cutting them off. Scripture does not lend itself to that as a form of discipline in that respect. A prophet in these days was a spokesman for God and interceded for others, and we saw that happen with Abraham, just as he'd done the intercession for Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 20, verse 8. Early the next morning, Abimelech summoned all of his officials. And when he told them what had happened, they were very much afraid. Now, why were they officials afraid? They had the fear of the Lord. God was the God of the Israelites, but for many other nations and people groups, they still acknowledged the God of the Israelites. And often in scripture you say, if your God will this, or ask your God that. And they acknowledge the God. And I've, I've had that many of a time. Where people have contacted me and said, oh, can you pray to your God for this for me, or that for me? But these people who are asking me aren't Christians. 
but they're, asked, they're, they're, they're acknowledging, my God. And that may happen to you sometimes. So sometimes we even we intercede for the non-believer. And we need to do that and keep praying for their salvation. Now, Abimelech could have kept quiet, not telling his officials, but he was king. But he did not touch uh, Abraham, just like David did not touch the Lord's anointed Saul when he had been in the wrong. Because Abimelech recognised that Abraham belonged to God. David recognised for all Saul's faults and demon possession and all these dip- or op- oppression, all these different things, he belonged to the Lord. And brothers and sisters, we've got to recognise that in each other. You'll be a lot slower to judge people and attack people when you recognise they belong to the Lord. Yeah, but they did it. Yeah, they might have done, but they belong to the Lord. He's purchased them. He, God, will deal with them. In actual fact, David uh, on occasion said, Lord, you deal with me rather than man. Why? Because he's being dealt with in love. And so we see that uh, this situation unfolding and we reckon uh, Abimelech is quiet and refrained probably with his anger because he recognises Abraham's God. Genesis 20 verse 9, uh, Abimelech calls Abraham in and says to him, what, what have you done to us? How have I wronged you that you have brought such a great, great guilt upon me and my kingdom? You have done this to me that you should not, what should not be done. And Abimelech asked Abraham, what was your reason for doing this? Abraham replied, I said to myself, well, straight away, that's a bad place, okay? There's safety and wise company. And if you're just going to deal with your life, with yourself, me, myself, and I, you will convince yourself to make the wrong decisions. Trust me, it's just reality. But Abraham replied, I said to myself, there is surely no fear of God in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she is really my sister, the daughter of my father, and though not of my mother. She became my wife. And when God had me wander from my father's household, I said to her, this is how you can show your love for me. Everywhere we go, say of me, he is my brother. Now that's not the best way to start a a marriage relationship, getting caught in deception. What a contrast with Abimelech. Abraham seems to have lost the fear of God, so he's fearing man more than God. He doesn't acknowledge that he's done anything wrong. He's just saying how it come about. He's responsible for himself and his wife lying. And Abraham's fear of man blinded him. And it's amazing to consider that Abimelech was a pagan king, but he does the right thing in the situation because of God. Abraham is an Israelite, father of the nation, in a relationship with God and does the wrong thing. (laughs) You know? Humanity. It appears that Abraham's agreement with Sarah to say that he was his sister overtook the promise that God had given him because God had promised that they would have a son. And so, why is Abraham worrying about a situation? Because he's going to be killed, but they haven't had a son yet. And it said he would be the father of many nations. So, a lot of the time, the big shadow is that shadow called fear. Fear has come in. Abraham was fearful from the off, right from the start, when he meets his wife. He persuades her. To say, wherever we go in life, say that I am your brother. This is how you can show your love for me. Now, it's manipulation at the end of the day. Right from the off, is manipulating Sarah and saying, well, if you want to show me you love me, then do this. And a lot of people can be like that. Well, if you love me, you'll buy it for me. And it's manipulation. And it's wrong. It's not right. Love is unconditional. 
not conditional, unconditional. And so we see there's a real mishmash with this whole situation. And fear has gripped Abraham again. And you see this fear trait in Abraham's life. And whenever Abraham tends to make a wrong decision, the primary cause under the layers is fear. And often with us, you know, when we make wrong decisions, sometimes when you peel back the layers of the onion, you get closer to the core, you know? And sometimes we can make mistakes and wrong decisions and it's looking, not just acknowledging it's a mistake or wrong decision, but why do I do that? What causes me to do that, you know? Uh, I, I, I don't want to do it. It's like a subconsciousness and it just comes in. So a lot of the time to get free, we've got to kind of go backwards a little bit and understand some of the cracks that might be in our character and ask God to repair them and he's faithful and he does. And Abraham's crack was fear. Every time fear came on Abraham, the old nature come out. God had just told him that he would have Isaac within a year and that he would have many descendants. If that was the case, there was no way that God would let him be killed on account of his wife. Abraham had forgotten what God had said to him. Genesis 15.1 Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. He was saying, I've got you. And all you need is in me. I'm going to sustain you. I'm going to provide for you. And I'm going to protect you. But whenever fear came up, Abraham wobbled. And that was Abraham's weakness. And, and your weakness and my weakness might be different to that. But God can strengthen us. And in actual fact, as Paul said, I boast in my weaknesses now to glorify God. Because God has brought me through them. God has turned my weaknesses into his glory. You know? Wonderful. Sometimes we allow people to draw the wrong conclusions or wrong impressions by not telling them the whole truth. Abraham told facts, uh, but not all of the facts. He told the truth. But he didn't tell the whole truth. There's my side, your side, and the truth. And many a time, people, you see it in media, you see it in Hollywood, you see it in the entertainment business, you see it all time and time again. People say stuff, but they don't say all of it. People make statements, but they don't explain the circumstances that these things have come out in. And a lot of the time, they purposely leave you to make your own conclusions. Oh, well, you know, all, all I'm saying is that. I mean, you make your own mind up. That's all I know. When often they do know a lot more, but they want you to draw a wrong conclusion about somebody else. So they hint, they leave open-ended questions, open-ended sentences, and all the implications are to make you think, in actual fact, this shirt is red in reality, in actual fact. But the truth is it's not red, it's blue. And as I said, there's my side, your side and the truth. People have different perspectives. So we have to be very, very, very careful because that is sin. That is sin. And what Abraham was doing was sinful. How do you react when you're caught with your fingers in the till like Abraham? Abraham does not take any responsibility. In actual fact, he makes excuses and at one point he almost blames God. He said, when God made me wander, as if, well, if I wasn't a wanderer, if I, if I didn't have to leave my home country, I wouldn't be in this situation. It wouldn't be my fault, you see. And we make excuses. And, and Abraham was almost blaming God, like Adam. Adam said, well, if you hadn't given me this woman, it's this woman you gave me. She's the problem. I was all right till she turned up. And we fall into this place of not taking responsibility. And sometimes we even have to take responsibility for one another. You know, you knew, but 
You didn't kind of do anything. First Peter 3, verse 5. For this reason, the way holy women in the past put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him Master, some say Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Do not give way to fear. And fear is really difficult. We live in a society that's fear-driven. You know, people suffering more than ever with depression, with anxiety, with panic attacks. And I've been there with all three. Some people with suicidal thoughts. I've been there as well. I understand. And adrenaline rushes, all such things. And we live in a fear-driven society, even now with this whole pandemic around the world and unemployment going up and all sorts of issues that we don't even know what we're going to face. But that is where perfect love drives out all fear. Because when you're a Christian and you know that you know, you know what, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, next week, I'm not even sure what happened last week. But this I know. Little lamb, little lamb, do you know your creator? This I know. I am his and he is mine. What security. Despite Abraham being in the wrong, Sarah still submitted. She obeyed him, which, you know, is up for debate. Should she or shouldn't she? This doesn't mean that husbands should lead their wives into sin. By no means. Scripture says we shouldn't lead any, even the littlest of uh, the Lord's people into sin, the littlest of his children. But it demonstrates how, far, uh, how Sarah, the mother of the Jewish nation, showed honour to her husband through her obedience and submission. Genesis 20, verse 14. Then Abimelech bought sheep and cattle, male and female slaves, and gave them to Abraham. And he returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, My land is before you. Live wherever you like. To Sarah he said, I am giving your brother a thousand shekels of silver. This is to cover the offence against you before all who are with you. You are completely vindicated. Now, she needed to be vindicated. Why? Because she was a part of it. She lied as much as Abraham at the end of the day. She said, he's my brother. You know? God was now, bear in mind, uh, Abimelech gives all these gifts to him, but bear in mind, God was not rewarding Abraham's behaviour. He was being faithful and gracious towards Abraham when Abraham had been faithless. God had promised to bless him and was being faithful to himself in the promise. Don't make a mistake. God's mercy on us is not necessarily his approval of us or what we've done. It's just his grace and forgiveness. Hallelujah. And sometimes people can do something wrong. They've received grace and so they think, oh, it's all right then. No, it's not all right. God is not vindicating what we've done. What I've done is still wrong. It will always be wrong. But because of his grace, I've been forgiven. The punishment has already been allocated to Jesus on my behalf. Hallelujah. So God wasn't approving of his behaviour by him receiving these things. Restoration and blessing did not mean God has approved of past sins. It's a demonstration of the power of God's forgiveness of the love of God in Jesus at the cross. In showing such generosity to Abraham, Abimelech was essentially uh, heaping burning coals on Abraham's head. If you read Romans 12, 20. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will be heaping coals on his head. 
And really, it should have been a role reversal. You would have thought Abraham was the one who should be paying off Abimelech and giving him gifts because he's not, you know, he could have killed him at the end of the day. Genesis 20, verse 17. Then Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech in his wife and his slave girls so that they could have children again. For the Lord had closed up every womb in Abimelech's household because of Abraham's wife Sarah. In Genesis 12, 3, God promised Abraham that he would bless those who blessed him and he would curse those who cursed him. And that was exactly the situation. Now, because Abimelech had taken Sarah, he come under a curse, and the curse was the barrenness across his entire people. But when he released Sarah and he blessed Abraham, uh, God is then going to bless Abimelech. So whatever, I, whatever Abimelech had given to Abraham, I can guarantee you that he got that back tenfold over. Because God now was going to bless him because he had, he had blessed Abraham in letting him go and giving him the choice of wherever he wanted to live. So he put himself in a position to be blessed by God. Abimelech respected the anointing that God had placed on Abraham. Abraham was a prophet of God, yet he lied in his role as the prophet. He caused heartache uh, to innocent people. He had, he had had the fear of man override his reverent fear of God. He had not accepted responsibility for lying. He put his wife Sarah in a dangerous situation. Wow. Yet God protects him and God loves him and God keeps him as a prophet to the nation. It was not Abram's righteousness that caused Abimelech's healing, but it was God's grace, the grace of God. Are you using the grace of God correctly or are you abusing the grace of God? It's amazing to think at this time Sarah is into her 90s but is still being taken to kings because of her beauty. Yet she's in her 90s. And these kings had harems of lots of women. But yet there was something about the beauty in Sarah that she was desirable as a wife at the age of 90 plus and not just by any Joe, by the kings who had the best stock, as it were, the most beautiful of women. But yet there's something about Sarah and her beauty that captivated. Wow. This part of Abraham's life displays the wonderful grace of God who saves and sanctifies in spite of ourselves. He saved Abraham in spite of Abraham. Why? Because he's a covenant-making God. And he has made a covenant with you and with me through Jesus Christ, which is, according to Scripture, a far greater covenant than the covenant of Abraham and Moses. The covenant you're under, the covenant I am under, is far greater than this covenant because it's an eternal covenant which can not fail. Even when we muck up, this covenant is built on better promises in Jesus. How wonderful. Don't let fear cause you to make the wrong decision. Be liberated. I was with a friend of mine this week and uh, we were discussing about fear. And in the conversation, they were explaining how fear had been a stumbling block most of their lives, but how they were slowly getting free. Uh, uh, and, and as they were getting older, they were dealing with it more. They're getting the boldness to deal with fear more and more and more. And I encourage you, fear will lead to mistakes. It does. I've been there myself. It does. So I encourage you. God bless you. 
Don't forget to share the, uh, the sermons with friends, with family, whatever. Uh, let's continue this journey. This journey with Abram, we are, we are now, the runway is now come up on the radar. We're nearly there. We're nearly there. Don't forget, we'll be meeting again on the 4th of April at Thamesview School, 10.30. Come and celebrate with us. It will be Easter Sunday, that Sunday. Easter Sunday as well. What a double celebration to celebrate the life, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that soon and coming King. God bless you. We'll catch you again next week.